my name is Aaron Lee. Um, uh, it's a real privilege and an honor uh, to give this Grand Rounds uh, to you. And I have to apologize uh, for giving it virtually. Um, I, there was a misunderstanding on my part on uh, when I needed to uh, be there in Salt Lake City. And then by the time I realized um, it, it was uh, it was too difficult to get call coverage uh, for Tuesday night. So again, I apologize um, for giving this virtually. And if uh, um, all is going well, I should be uh, arriving into Salt Lake City as uh, as I as this uh, as you listen to this uh, grand rounds. These are my financial disclosures. Um, I'm going to break down this talk into four sections. Uh, the first is an introduction to um, some of the concepts that I'll be talking about. Uh, and then the second part uh, will be the beginnings of how we got started um, in uh, this area of artificial intelligence and deep learning. Uh, the third will be about uh, what I think is a, a very important study that we did uh, around uh, autonomous AI. And then finally, I want to end by talking about uh, future directions. So I hope all of you know that we are firmly living in this era of big data and machine learning. Um, we as human society are living in a very different time than we were even 20 years ago. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, we are living in a time where the information um, that is flowing all around us every day uh, is being captured, harnessed, uh, and then um, used uh, to uh, train and manipulate very powerful machine learning algorithms. And these algorithms are um, uh, indirectly or directly influencing uh, things that we see and perceive uh, in the world. Or, um, and it is really the first time uh, that, um, uh, that human society is uh, uh, being, um, uh, being so heavily influenced uh, by uh, computer algorithms. Um, and I always like to start these talks uh, also by uh, disambiguating uh, some of these terms. Uh, AI, machine learning, and deep learning are unfortunately uh, used interchangeably in the news media. Uh, they're used in a way where they um, uh, uh, appear to be synonymous, uh, but they actually have uh, very formal definitions. So the, the field of artificial intelligence is actually very, very old. Uh, it's been around since really the dawn of uh, modern computing, um, and it is um, uh, a, um, a field that describes um, uh, the idea of uh, intelligence being um, formed by something man-made. Uh, the field, a field within uh, the uh, artificial intelligence um, is uh, machine learning. And then uh, there's a subfield within that uh, called uh, deep learning. And the field of deep learning is relatively new. So what is deep learning? Um, well, to understand that, you sort of have to understand what an artificial neural network is. Um, and this is uh, these uh, class of machine learning algorithms that were very popular in the 60s and 70s. Um, and, uh, but at the time, uh, a traditional artificial neural network could not really be extended uh, to more than uh, three layers. So in my opinion, uh, there's four advances that led to the birth of what we call deep learning today. Uh, first, it was a realization that computer graphics cards uh, could be used to vastly accelerate linear algebra operations. It turned out uh, that the mathematics behind uh, rotating and rendering polygons in three-dimensional space for computer games uh, was actually um, a very similar to the math that was uh, used to train deep learning models. And so all of a sudden, uh, people had in their computers a mathematical code processor uh, that could be harnessed uh, to use um, uh, and train these very large uh, deep learning models. The second was the use of these uh, filters known as convolutional filters uh, that could exploit the local coherence uh, between pixels. Uh, these filters actually existed uh, since about 1980s, uh, but they could never be implemented because they were too comput computationally complex. 
Um, and so when uh, the GPUs were available uh, that to, to be used for accelerating these operations, uh, convolutional filters actually became feasible uh, to implement computationally. Uh, the third was the use of nonlinear activation functions. Uh, and the final one was that our computer hardware and architecture had evolved to a point uh, where the storage of large data sets uh, became possible. And so you had both the computational means uh, and the capacity uh, to store and process large data sets uh, th that uh, could be used to train uh, deep learning models. Um, and that all led to this very exciting time uh, that we live in today, uh, where uh, as we increase uh, the size of the deep learning models and we increase uh, the amount of data that they are fed, the performance just seems to increase and increase. And this is one of the reasons why even today, every hour, there's a new article about ChatGPT or the la large language models uh, doing something that uh, n had never been possible before. Um, and, and this gets uh, to you know this time that we live in, which uh, people are calling the fourth industrial revolution, where um, now these uh, AI methods uh, are um, powering pretty much everything that we do. Every uh, email that we write, every search engine query that we type in, there are very, very powerful machine learning algorithms that are driving the content uh, in terms of what we read and we see. Um, and on the biological side, we've reached a point uh, where in molecular biology uh, um, and the omics world are able to generate huge data sets uh, that could be used. So we have this convergence of having uh, um, oceans of data available to us and the AI methods uh, uh, coupled to analyze them. So I want to walk you through our journey uh, into how we got into uh, deep learning. Um, and this goes back to when I joined uh, the University of Washington. Um, one of the first things I did uh, was I extracted all the OCT imaging that was available to us uh, at our hospital. And that was akin to about 5.5 million OCT B-scan images um, on about 16,000 patients for more than one decade of time. And then uh, from the EHR, I had access uh, to uh, all the clinical variables. Um, I could match up each o OCT to the visual acuity, the diagnosis, uh, whether they had laser or intravitreal injection, and the uh, OCT expert uh, interpretation. <clears throat> Um, and uh, I, for a while, I was sitting on this data set, not really knowing what to do with it, because at the time, um, there weren't really scalable uh, uh, algorithms that could be used uh, to uh, collect and sift information from these OCT images. So one of my friends um, at, uh, told me that I should try this thing called deep learning. And I said, oh, you know, that's a great idea, but I, I really don't think it's going to work. I think it's just a fad. It probably uh, just passed. And he said, no, 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 you should really try it. Let me put you in touch with uh, some of my, my friends at NVIDIA. Uh, and NVIDIA, I told NVIDIA about my, my data set, and they said, um, uh, you know, that sounds amazing. Um, why haven't you tried deep learning yet? And I said, well, I don't have one of your fancy graphics cards. And two days later, they had shipped uh, um, a, one of their top, uh, top end uh, graphics cards to our lab um, uh, from Taiwan. Uh, and we uh, constructed our first uh, deep learning experiment. And it, this was, in my mind, sort of the easiest problem uh, to get started with. Um, and it was whether deep learning could distinguish between normal OCT images and uh, those from AMD. <clears throat> <clears throat> we constructed a, a data set of about 100,000 uh, images, and we trained this model at the time, which was uh, that was state-of-the-art called VGG16. Um, and we got these results. Um, so about a week after getting uh, the, that graphics cards from Taiwan, uh, we uh, were able to achieve these sorts of metrics. Um, and I was blown away, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I really did not believe or think uh, that deep learning was capable of uh, doing this. And I thought I had made uh, some sort of um, uh, embarrassing, you know, uh, beginner mistake uh, in, in our experimental setup. Uh, and I was very nervous about publishing this. Um, and so this sort of gets at uh, the problem of uh, these models being black boxes. 
uh, even today we struggle with this problem of trying to understand why or how uh, these deep learning models are working. Um, I dug around uh, the computer vision literature at the time and uh, I tried to find uh, some sort of way to understand what, what the model was doing how it was able to achieve these sort of incredible, you know, AUROCs and sensitivities and specificities. Um, and I found this visualization method that even, you know, today I still use because I think it's very intuitive. Uh, the way it works is um, if I give you this picture and I ask you, do you think there's a ball in this picture? Uh, you would say with 100% certainty that uh, yes, <coughs> there is a ball in this picture. Uh, if I uh, then cover up a very small part of the picture and I ask you again, is there a ball? You would still say yes. Uh, but if I keep moving this uh, box around and at every possible pixel position in the, in the picture, I keep asking you, is there a ball in this picture? Eventually, the box ends up here. And I will ask you, is there a ball in this picture? And you'll say, I'm not sure anymore. And so that's what we did. We took OCT images that the model had not been trained on and we systematically occluded um, every possible position uh, in the B scan, and we watched this happen. Watch what we, what happened to the probability of the model calling this uh, macular degeneration. And if the probability dropped a lot, uh, then <clears throat> we would highlight that region, uh, that pixel position, um, uh, with. Uh, with a with um, you know uh, a high value um, and when we um, and so when we did that on these three B scan images uh, we were able to generate uh, these heat maps uh, that showed uh, that the model was actually looking at areas <coughs> that were clinically uh, relevant uh, and that made me feel a million times better about the model that we had trained uh, that it wasn't some um, a silly mistake that I had made, but the model had actually learned uh, to try and distinguish uh, the, the relevant features between uh, what was normal OCTB scans and what were abnormal OCTB scans. Uh, from there, we went on to our second study, um, and this was a study that we published uh, in uh, Biomedical Optics Express uh, that has to do with the segmentation of uh, intraretinal fluid on OCT scans. Um, and so here's an example of uh, the deep learning model where on the left you see the original B-scan images and on the right uh, you see the areas, um, uh, 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 actually the, um, the confidence of the areas uh, that, are, uh, that the model called uh, intraretinal fluid. And at first, you know, I thought these, these results are really exciting. Um, and so I went and showed, you know, some of the computer vision folks and said, they said, oh, Aaron, this is great, but this is actually a very simple problem. Uh, all you have to do is find the uh, ILM, which, you know, there's tons of uh, good methods of doing that. And then you find this bright band here um, and everything in between that's dark is uh, intraretinal fluid. But if you follow that heuristic, um, you know, of course, the shadow underneath vessels could erroneously be labeled uh, as uh, intraretinal fluid, uh, whereas in fact uh, the deep learning models um, actually able to not be fooled by these uh, dark areas uh, that are uh, artifacts of the shadow, uh, shadows cast by the vessels um, and instead correctly label uh, the areas of intraretinal fluid. In the paper we showed that the model was uh, as good as uh, clinician to clinician variants. Um, uh, but more importantly, uh, there was this video that was hard, honestly, to put into the paper. Um, and what we did here is we really slowed down the rate um, of the deep learning models learning to do this task. And so if you remember, this was this B-scan that I just showed you that has this area of, of the, of the uh, air shadow underneath the vessel. And if you watch this model learn to do this, it will at first call this area uh, underneath the vessel intraretinal fluid. But as it is fed more and more examples <clears throat> and it's trained over a longer period of time, you can see it getting better and better and better. And, you know, it, it learns that even subretinal fluid is not intra intraretinal fluid or, over time. But there's something that happened that was sort of uh, um, uh, um, hair raising at the beginning of this ta uh, video. And I'll play, play it again for you uh, and, uh, and then it'll pause. So here, right when it's starting to, you know, go on this exponential um, uh, growth in learning, it, it 
it actually learned to do something uh, uh, different than what we were trying to teach it to do. If you look, the areas that it's highlighting um, is not the intragranular fluid at all, but actually it's, it's, it, it learned the, the organization of the retina. It realized in order for it to learn where the intragranular fluid was, it had to understand these anatomic boundaries first. Um, and what I find amazing about that is that the model, uh, the deep learning model essentially had identified a sub-problem that it had to solve on its own in order to solve the bigger task of, uh, of intraretinal fluid. And I kind of view this as sort of an example of emergent uh, AI behavior. <clears throat> so, you know, what do we take away from these uh, first two experiments? Uh, we learned that, um, you know, machine learning is always limited by the ground truth. So <laughs> what I mean by that is that if clinicians disagree on, uh, uh, on whether, you know, a certain OCT scan has CSR versus, you know, wet AMD, uh, then uh, the model will always uh, be confused. It will never do better than the average human confusion around the label uh, of for the ground truth. But it seems to also have this incredible potential. Uh, li like you saw in the video, it, it, it has this incredible flexibility to work with me, um, you know, different imaging types and, but, and, and also identify sub-problems that it needs to solve all of, on its own. Um, and, you know, our lab and others started to think about how you can push AI and deep learning to do more. Um, and that sort of led to, you know, the many, many different uh, experiments and papers that we uh, published afterwards that showed everything from being able to predict um, an OCTA scan from regular standard structural OCT um, or, you know, predict, um, you know, uh, uh, outflow facility of the trabecular meshwork from uh, the Myers of a Goldman tonometer. Um, and so it really has, uh, 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 you know, inspired the field to do quite a bit. Um, but I, I would love to spend this next section talking about a very important topic uh, in our field, and that has to do with uh, autonomous AI. Um, and what I mean by autonomous AI uh, is um, so, sort of, if you think about uh, the self-driving car industry, there's sort of level zero or one level, uh, you know, um, uh, algorithms that help us drive our cars a, a little bit safer, but the driver is doing everything, all the way to level five um, uh, self-driving cars that you get in the car and you can sleep or take a nap and it'll be fine because the car is doing uh, everything completely uh, autonomously. Um, and those so same levels of, you know, Tesla car automation or uh, autonomous car, uh, self-driving cars exist uh, in the medical domain and they're broken out sort of uh, in these sort of uh, uh, ways where, you know, level one is sort of data presentation and level two is clinical decision support. Uh, and those are the assistive AI algorithms. And the autonomous AI algorithms are level three and level four, level five, where uh, full automation is um, basically, you know, AI algorithms that are being used uh, in, you know, populations where there's no human clinician uh, in the loop at all. Uh, and they're making, you know, uh, fully autonomous uh, um, medical decisions. And so what's kind of amazing to me um, and, and uh, to many others in the medical space is that um, somehow uh, in ophthalmology, we went from level zero all the way to level five. Um, and we have very few AI algorithms in between. Whereas in uh, the field of radiology, <clears throat> it's the reverse. Um, they have many, many AI algorithms that are up to level two but almost no algorithms uh, that go beyond uh, level three. Um, and so that led, uh, you know, Eric Topol, who is sort of a famous uh, medical technologist to uh, tweet this out about how, uh, you know, most people think radiology is leading the AI movement, but it's really ophthalmology um, that is uh, leading the AI movement. <clears throat> and that's because of what's happened with, uh, in the diabetic retinopathy space. 
Uh, in the diabetic retinopathy screening uh, space, um, there are now today, I believe, three or four um, FDA-approved algorithms that are fully autonomous. Um, and they are making clinical medical decisions at the population level um, it, it, with uh, no clinical oversight. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I think um, uh, uh, there's something known as this um, Gartner hype curve. Uh, um, and uh, it's really important uh, to, you know, think about, you know, where we are on this hype curve. Uh, it's really unclear to me whether we are um, have reached the peak of inflated expectations or not with regard to AI and medicine. If anything, this, this peak seems to be growing ever higher, so we may still be on this ascending limb here. Uh, but it's very important uh, in this time space when they, these algorithms are being deployed to understand you know, where, where the real plateau of pro productivity is. Uh, so um, we uh, embarked on a study um, uh, a few years ago to compare the performance of seven AI models, uh, diabetic retinopathy screening models, in a real-world screening setting. Um, and so the reason why we did this uh, is because there were many, many papers that have been coming out uh, by you know these uh, the companies, the commercial entities in this space, claiming that they had you know amazing performance. Um, uh, and even um, uh, yeah, even if you uh, trusted them uh, that they had you know done everything ethically and they had no um, uh, 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 no influence on the on the uh, on the t final test performance of their models, uh, <laughs> you still had uh, no way of comparing uh, the the algorithms A uh, versus B in a head to head fashion. Uh, so we wanted to be able to compare them in a in a uh, with equal sort of on an equal playing field. Uh, so what we did is we reached out uh, at the time to all the companies that we could find um, that were um, uh, 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 working in this space. Um, and we, uh, after uh, uh, discussing with them all, five all ultimately agreed to be part of our uh, study. We invited every uh, company to submit up to two different AI models um, uh, to, for our study. What we then did uh, is we went uh, to the VA teleretinal uh, screening system and from two different sites, uh, one in Seattle, one in Atlanta, we extracted all the imaging that was available from the teleretinal screening system and we uh, combined them together to create a, a full data set of about 311,000 images that had all been labeled by the original t VA teleretinal grader during uh, routine clinical care. Um, in a subset of about 7,000 images, uh, we went through an arbitrated um, uh, uh, th uh, three retina specialists grading uh, um, uh, uh, arbitration to arrive at a, f a final, um, uh, uh, final clinical grade for each of these diabetic retinopathy images. Um, and this allowed, um, you know, basically us to compare the seven different AI models uh, versus the original teleretinal grader. Uh, in um, a, uh, against this arbitration set. Uh, so these are sort of the uh, headline results of our study. Uh, we had these seven uh, different algorithms, uh, and we showed um, uh, that all uh, 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 all the algorithms uh, exhibited you know high overall uh, negative predictive uh, value, and it, in a screening context, this is absolutely what you want. Uh, you absolutely want uh, to make sure that your um, uh, your negative predictive value is uh, is as high as possible. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the algorithms showed a low positive predictive value, meaning that there were a lot of false positives being referred um, uh, in uh, if this was actually deployed uh, in the clinic. Um, in my opinion, you know this is one of the most important results uh, from our project. Uh, where we uh, again use the arbitrated set um, uh, to compare directly the VA teleretinal grader uh, in a pairwise fashion uh, to each of the uh, seven different algorithms. And what we were very pleased to sh uh, show was that the VA teleretinal graders are actually doing an amazing job. They had 100% sensi sensitivity for moderate uh, or higher of MPDR. Um, and then algorithms E, F, and G were statistically similar uh, to the VA grader for moderate MPDR or higher. 
meaning that they would uh, would not uh, uh, behave ex- almost statistically indistinguishable. Um, you obviously cannot do better than the VA grader since they had 100% sensitivity, uh, but <clears throat> uh, being uh, indistinguishable um, to the VA grader uh, in a large data set with a pairwise fashion means basically that they made uh, very few mistakes. And so in my opinion, these algorithms, E, F, and G, are safe for deployment in the VA teleretinal screening system. <clears throat> uh, you know, some of the limitations of this, obviously, um, it only really applies uh, to the context of, uh, of the VA. Uh, we did notice that the dilation uh, uh, it was important to reduce the rate of ungradable images. Um, and the algorithms varied very widely, uh, despite having regulatory approval or being clinically deployed somewhere in the world. And this gets to uh, this issue that I think it's actually very important um, to assess these models uh, it, it, with an external independent validation, especially if you're planning to um, deploy them uh, and pull away the human clinician altogether from, uh, from the medical loop. Uh, so I, you know, I, I do believe that these models are are, are very powerful and are ready uh, for deployment. Uh, but it, it it makes sense to make sure in a small subset that they work in your um, uh, uh, clinical informatics system uh, at your hospital. Mm. One of the uh, criticisms of the uh, diabetic retinopathy AI models is that they are uh, doing an amazing job for diabetic retinopathy, uh, but uh, there's a lot more that is uh, covered um, uh, in a, a retinal color, color fundus photograph of the retina uh, than diabetic retinopathy. Uh, and when you're uh, using a teleretinal screening system uh, for diabetic uh, disease, uh, the, t- the readers, the human readers, are actually also screening for other conditions, other incidental findings. Uh, that would require, um, you know, referral. Um, And so there's a follow-up study that we're doing in partnership with the CDC. Uh, There were two years during, uh, for uh, the NHANES study, where they had collected uh, retinal images, um, and they, all of them were graded uh, by the Wisconsin Reading Center at that time. Uh, And the goal of this uh, 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 study is to do a more comprehensive screening for not just diabetic retinopathy, but also AMD and glaucoma. Um, and to do this, uh, uh, nine companies have agreed uh, to send uh, their models for evaluation, and that means shipping a workstation uh, that can work without the internet and be uh, only connected to power um, uh, to the CDC RDC, uh, where um, uh, you know I'm not allowed to even bring in a cell phone uh, uh, to the uh, to the room to do this study. <clears throat> so this study is uh, ongoing and we hope to be able to communicate some of the findings of this uh, later on this year. Um, so I do want to spend a, a little bit of time talking about the future directions and in particular one study <laughs> that we are starting up at University of Washington that I hope will uh, you know, be revolutionary uh, for the field. <clears throat> Uh, so if you take a step back and you ask yourself, um, you know, what are the data sets that are ideal for deep learning? Uh, whenever I give these talks, uh, invariably uh, people come up to me afterwards uh, and they're excited because, you know, they have a data set that uh, they've been uh, collecting and working on for their for many years of their life. And they think uh, deep learning might be, uh, you know, the perfect solution uh, to their problems. Uh, and so when I start uh, talking to them about their data set, <coughs> I, 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 in my mind, I'm constructing <laughs> this graph where the number of measurements are on the y-axis um, and the number of subjects are on the x-axis. And almost always, uh, the data sets I hear about are in this quadrant um, uh, of, the, of the Cartesian coordinate plane. Um, and, and it's, uh, you know, a couple hundred um, or even, you know, 500 uh, patients uh, where they have done a ton of different different <coughs> different measurements on them, uh, and um, unfortunately, uh, in machine learning, there's something known as the curse of dimensionality, uh, and this makes it very hard actually to do deep learning research with. 
uh, what you really want is uh, uh, almost the reverse of this. Um, uh, you want uh, a, a, a data set where there's a lot of independent samples and relatively few key measurements. Uh, of course, if we had infinite time and infin infinite money, we'd all be living in the upper right, right quadrant, uh, but, uh, but reality often precludes uh, that from occurring. <clears throat> So, you know, the data sets that characteristics are that one that it has to be large. Uh, you want diverse pathology captured in uh, your data set. You ideally want your data set to be ba balanced for sex, race, and ethnicity uh, to make sure that your AI models are not uh, biased in some way uh, for, um, uh, um, uh, uh, for or against uh, any particular uh, sex, uh, race, or ethnicity. Uh, and as I was explaining earlier, um, the vast majority of deep learning advances have occurred in the field where uh, either images or waveforms or, uh, or language um, is used. And in those three sort of domains, there's local uh, spatial coherence uh, that the models uh, can exploit. <clears throat> um, one of the most successful data sets uh, for doing machine learning and deep learning uh, came from a, uh, an a, a, a effort in the United Kingdom called the UK Biobank. And the UK Biobank uh, was started in you know, to 2006 to 2010, where you know, approximately half a million people, uh, they had asked uh, them to come in and they started to collect all sorts of data um, uh, 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 over the years. And it has really generated one of the most um, uh, amazing uh, uh, resources for doing uh, data science uh, today. <clears throat> it, it's been a tremendous success. Um, 15 petabytes of data have been generated. There are uh, 2,000 ongoing uh, research projects around the world. Uh, 1,400 papers have been published, and 200 of them have been published in the Nature Family Journals. So really, really impactful, and really the field of medicine uh, took a su substantial step forward uh, because of the UK Biobank. Uh, one of the <clears throat> uh, um, um, uh, seminal pieces of, of, uh, of work in our field uh, came from the Google Group, where they used the UK Biobank, and they showed that using from a color fundus photograph, um, they could predict the age, the sex, smoking status, hemoglobin A1C, body mass index, systolic blood pressure, and diastolic blood pressure, all from a color fundus photograph. Um, and later on, they showed even that they could predict, you know, the the uh, the hemoglobin uh, uh, concentration and therefore the anemia status uh, from a color fundus photograph. So a really amazing work, um, and it sort of spurred uh, this idea that you can you learn so much about the human body through the eye, uh, and the eye became sort of um, a, a center point for doing deep learning uh, in the field of medicine because uh, the images were easy to obtain. They were they did not require radiation. Uh, they were they required instruments that were you know on the scale of uh, a few, uh, ten or. It tended to twenty thousand uh, dollars, but there's a couple really big problems with the UK Biobank, um, and uh, there is this is not really a criticism of the UK Biobank effort, uh, but an unfortunate reality of how the UK Biobank was set up. First, uh, to reach the number of half a million, they they had to do convenient sampling, where they set up recruitment centers in the United Kingdom. And anybody who is wa willing to walk through the doors, uh, they they took for uh, took into the study, uh, and unfortunately that led to a situation where there was a healthy volunteer bias. Uh, the people who are willing to walk through the doors were uh, often much healthier uh, than the normal um, uh, 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 participant uh, in the in the UK population. Uh, and unfortunately, it was very heavily white British. In fact, it's about 95% white British. Um, and, uh, and to il illustrate uh, the healthy volunteer bias, uh, this graph, I think, speaks volumes, where uh, they showed the mortality rate uh, for people in the UK population versus 
those in the UK biobank. And uh, on average, uh, um, the uh, being a UK biobank participant, your life expectancy was about 10 to 15 years longer uh, than the same UK population that the participant came from. So clearly, uh, you know, everything that we've learned from the UK biobank essentially has been on very healthy white British people. <clears throat> The other uh, sort of problem um, uh, with the UK Biobank um, is that it has um, a, a fairly onerous uh, uh, path in order to get access to the data set. Um, when we tried to get access to the data set at University of Washington, it took us about three years um, before we, the data sets actually arrived on, uh, on our hard drives. Um, and so in the criteria that is known as FAIR, or findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, I would say uh, the UK Biobank um, does a fairly good job at being findable, um, is decently interoperable, and is obviously very reusable, but is not as the most accessible uh, data set in the world. So that leads me to um, the, oh, the NIH. Uh, so the NIH um, uh, uh, saw the success of the UK Biobank uh, and similar efforts, and uh, they realized that there was a real need. Um, uh, they realized uh, that the US uh, should set up something similar to the UK Biobank, and they created the All of Us program, uh, which is modeled uh, in, in spirit very similar to the UK Biobank. Um, and then they uh, created the Bridge to AI uh, uh, program. The Bridge to AI program is a common fund program, and it's really uh, charged with generating flagship AI data, data sets for medicine. Uh, so Cecilia and I um, at, at UW uh, uh, during the pandemic marshaled our, our vision for this in about two months, and we submitted uh, about an 800-page uh, application where we thought we had close to 0% chance of, uh, of getting it. Somehow, miraculously, we ended up being one of the four uh, data generation projects that was ultimately funded. And the entire pr uh, program has about $110 million uh, over four years uh, to generate uh, these uh, flagship data sets for medicine. <clears throat> so I'll, I will tell you a little bit about our project. Um, our project is called AI Ready and Equitable Atlas for Diabetes Insights. Uh, and it is really targeting type 2 diabetes as a model disease uh, for studying um, uh, uh, and generating a flagship uh, AI ready data set. The ultimate goal of our data set is to create a multi dimensional, ethically sourced data set in diverse people for studying salutogenesis in type 2 diabetes. Um, if you're not sure uh, what the term salutogenesis means, uh, it, hopefully this will make it a little bit more clear. Um, we spend a tremendous amount of time and, uh, and money trying to examine the concept of pathogenesis of, or how you go from a healthy state to a disease state. And we try to cr create interventions that either slow or halt the progression of going from healthy to diseased. Uh, but we actually spend very little time uh, thinking about the reverse of this, um, and that's known as salutogenesis, which is the, the promotion of the, of the human body back to a healthy state. So to study this, uh, we assembled a very large team uh, uh, expanding across the United States. Uh, the, the NIH uh, broke up the Bridge AI into uh, these six different modules. We have a teaming module being led uh, by uh, um, Mike Snyder, who's the chair of the uh, genetics department at Stanford, uh, as well as Sarah Singer, um, uh, who is a team science um, uh, uh, a professor uh, in the School of Medicine. We have a skills and workforce module being led by uh, Linda, Linda Zangwill and Sally Baxter at UCSD. We have an ethics module being led by uh, Alvin Liu and Kadicha Ferryman, uh, as well as Megan Collins from, uh, from Hopkins, uh, and a team at U UCSD. Uh, we have a tools module being led by Bavesh Patel at Kalmi, as well as uh, uh, folks at OHSU, uh, and then a data module being led by Cynthia Owsley <coughs> and Jerry McGuinn. 
Um, and uh, you might notice that uh, Joe Ricciotta is at several different uh, parts of this um, uh, um, uh, project, and that's because he is leading an effort uh, with American Indians uh, on our project. And finally, we have a standards module that is trying to find uh, and define uh, uh, representational standards for encoding uh, the data set being led by myself, um, <laughs> as well as Christopher Shute at JHU. Uh, so uh, what we're trying to do is uh, borrow um, uh, an idea from a, a single cell RNA seq uh, to study saluted genesis. Um, and what we what happens in single cell RNA seq uh, is that there's a population of cells that is sampled, and the transcriptome of each cell is characterized individually um, uh, using single cell RNA seq technology. Uh, then, if you apply uh, machine learning and do a dimension reduction using something known as a UMAP, uh, you often can generate uh, these graphs um, where one sided graph uh, might be these cells in an embryonic stage, and then uh, you have different branches as they uh, you know, go through uh, a differentiation into a terminally differentiated state. And they follow along these nice little lines where, you know, two dots close to each other are basically very similar to cells that are very similar to each other in transcriptome. And two cells that are very far apart here are uh, two cells that are very different in their transcriptomics. Uh, and so what we're proposing to do um, is collect a data set uh, that is diverse, uh, and w wide enough and captures different aspects of, of the human body in different states to allow the participants to hopefully fall along these manifolds where uh, one um, axis will be pseudotime and then the other axis will be healthy versus diseased. And then these um, manifolds uh, will allow us to study e uh, both pathogenesis and salutogenesis. Um, in order for this technique uh, to work, uh, it's very important that uh, the data set is balanced with respect to the disease that you're interested in. And so we broke up type 2 diabetes into these four um, uh, bins. Uh, one is no diabetes at all. A second is lifestyle controlled or prediabetes. Um, and the third is oral medication controlled. And the fourth is insulin and medication controlled. Uh, one of the big uh, hopes and goals of our data set is for it to be uh, balanced uh, with respect to uh, race and uh, and gender, <coughs> excuse me, sex. <coughs> and so what we hope to do is collect a data set where a thousand of the participants will be white, a thousand black, a thousand Asian American, and a thousand Hispanic. Within that, a thousand of them will be normal, a thousand lifestyle controlled, a thousand oral medication controlled, and a thousand uh, insulin dependent. And within that, there'll be one-to-one -one balancing of males and females. We'll have three data collection sites, uh, one at University of Washington, one at UAB, and one at UCSD. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Joe is working with his team at Native Biodata, and they'll be facilitating discussions with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe uh, to collect a parallel data set that will be construct, uh, is, uh, 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 constructed in, in a similar fashion. Uh, the data set, uh, uh, the variables that we're actually collecting, uh, will of course, we'll collect a medical history, we'll perform uh, vitals, we'll get a whole host of different blood work and urine, uh, we'll perform uh, surveys including social determinants of health um, and depression. We'll do a battery of cognitive function testing. We'll obtain a 12-lead EKG. We'll do different elements of visual function including a visual acuity and low contrast sensitivity. We'll obtain uh, many different forms of ocular uh, imaging including uh, color fundus uh, uh, photography, OCT, OCTA, and, uh, and even hopefully FLEO. Um, it's uh, of note for these first three uh, different uh, imaging, uh, we're actually going to use devices uh, from three different manufacturers uh, in order to hopefully build a translational data set that will go in between uh, these different devices. We're going to send them home with an Apple Watch um, uh, to collect activity and heart rate and a continuous glucose monitor for 10 days. And we've built a, uh, a custom environmental sensor that can measure uh, the, the pollution levels, including PM1, PM2, 
uh, PM4 and PM10 uh, nitric dioxide and volatile organic compounds. Um, and the environmental sensor actually also has a spectrometer to measure um, the, uh, uh, the distribution of uh, wavelength of lights uh, that are present inside of uh, people's homes to hopefully understand how that might affect circadian rhythm. Um, and then we will uh, 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 bank uh, a whole bunch of blood, um, including uh, plasma and serum, and then we will store the blood in a way that will allow the generation of iPSC cells uh, and organoids in the future. We hope to perform whole genome sequencing if the cost of whole genome sequencing comes down. And uh, most ambitiously, we plan to open source our data set. So we hope uh, that um, we will be able to open source almost all the domains that you see here on the screen uh, in a fashion where anybody uh, with an internet connection anywhere in the world can click and download this data set and start using it uh, for, uh, for discovery. We have a lot of um, uh, uh, goals and challenges that we have to overcome in order for this project to be successful. We have a group of people who come from non-ophthalmology domains and have never worked together uh, before and have a very uh, tight timeline to deliver uh, on this and so we'll need um, help with team science. Uh, we want to promote diverse perspectives, uh, consider all the ethical uh, uh, consideration, engage the community. Uh, we need to build uh, standards where they don't exist, especially in some of the ophthalmic imaging domains. Um, uh, DICOM uh, is uh, ideally the format uh, that all the imaging should be in. Um, we are building a cloud-based platform for sharing and accessing the data, and we want to train the next generation of AI <coughs> researchers so that they can use this data set. Uh, so our um, uh, project is really everything that you see in this sort of green box, uh, but what we hope that others will do um, as we release this data set is that they'll use this data set uh, to do sort of hypothesis generating type research or biomarker discovery. And then if the manifolds are constructed, uh, then they can even do predictive a AI modeling where they can study things like therapeutic targets and uh, salutogenesis. We have this vision that um, any new data uh, will, that's generated will be deposited back into the open repository. We have an ongoing engagement with American Indians. Um, and uh, we hope that many other people will use this data set uh, for their research. And we really want to sort of accelerate uh, the field of data science and medicine as a result. Uh, so this is our project. Um, that's our website and that's our QR code. Uh, you're welcome to sort of follow along. Um, and uh, if you're interested uh, to be involved, uh, definitely uh, let me know. Um, and I, I want to end on a very positive note that I, I, I sort of believe that the future of data science and uh, uh, eye care as well as you know vision science research is very bright um, uh, mainly because of Michael Chang uh, becoming the director of the National Eye Institute and Michael Chang is uh, known for many many different things uh, but he is um, also uh, an informaticist um, and well known for his work in doing uh, bringing deep learning to uh, retinopathy of prematurity um, and so I'm sort of hopeful that his vision for where the National Eye Institute goes is towards, the, uh, towards harnessing uh, data science. Um, and I want to end by thanking uh, all my funding sources as well as uh, the members of my lab, um, uh, all of which, you know, none of this research would have been possible without them. Um, and um, I would be happy to take questions uh, as my plane lands in Salt Lake City. Um, uh, thank you very much, and again, I apologize for not being there in person. Uh, I will be on campus uh, shortly if, uh, if all goes well.